Welcome, 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 everybody. This is Cypher Den Chat. I'm your host, Tayambu Denku. I got my homie Pestilence with me tonight, also hosting. Um, Shouts to the rest of the team. And tonight we got special guests all the way from North Carolina, my homie Malls. What is going on, man? What's up? What's up, man? I'm doing good, man. Hey. How you feeling? Hey, man. It's, uh, you know, every day that I do the podcast on Mondays, it's always, I always feel exhausted and shitty because it's Monday and I work 12 hours. Oh boy. Mm. So it's always the same vibe, but then I get it. I get happy and excited that I get to do this to take me out of the funk of the terrible trash work day I've had. I feel you. (laughs) I feel you. I don't work 12 hours, but yo, eight is enough. Yeah. I, I just saw this thing recently. I don't know if, um, I don't know if you caught this or Mars at all, but I saw this random thing that um, Bernie Sanders was talking about. I don't know if you saw this, but he was um, he was doing some press conference or something, and he was talking about how he's going to put in a bill trying to get it passed to where we can he can change um the everyday Americans work week and go to them getting more money, but only working four day weeks. Like that's something he's actually talking about. Like I saw a press conference about it and uh, it's something he's really trying to do. And he made the debate that um, that the entire five day work week thing was based off of something that you guys created in the thirties. Right. When we needed more workers. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, technology is so high, you need less workers for a lot of the work. So why not pay your employees more money and have them, you know, have to work less days? And then um, it'll basically make their work, their, their work. What is it? What 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 am I trying to say? More productive. I I don't I don't want to say more productive. It's the employee's work life. Yeah, that that like, work life like, balance is important. Yeah. So, um, that's what he's that's what he's trying to do. The downfall of this is we know how greedy motherfuckers are that own major corporations and companies. They're not going to go for it. Right. It's just what right. it's just what it's gonna be. As much as I would love to see that happen, it's probably not gonna happen. Just yeah. like you know, everybody at one point in time was really rooting for Bernie Sanders to get in as president mm-hmm. because he would push things like this. Right. But you see, he's not in there. Exactly. Because yeah. Yeah. So status, I, status quo. Yeah, man. Pasto, you did you see anything about that? You didn't see that? I, I like vaguely heard about it, but it's like, man, for something like that to happen, don't have to eat all of them. We got to eat like one or two rich people in front of the rest of them so that they all stop <laughs> thinking that we're playing with them. You know, right. we, we gotta, just got to eat a couple of them publicly and then the rest will start to be like, OK, we'll give them a little bit more money. Right. You know, we'll cut our losses. I don't yeah, want to get eight in the streets. Yeah, we got to do something extreme to make them be like, oh, these motherfuckers ain't fucking around. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. Aside from that, man, um, what's been going on, Moss? How, how you been doing, man? What you been uh, what you been working on? Hey, look, man. So, you know, last year I, I put out my album um you know a subtle reminder and i like to chill in between albums like Mm. you know what i'm saying i like to rest so i can have stuff for the next album so this is usually my rest period but i've been feeling that urge that like okay i need to go ahead and start working on something now so i'm kind of in the very beginning stages of like all right I think it's time to go back into album mode. So, mm. cause I'm, I, I've never been a guy to really release singles like that. I will every now and then I'm, I'm more album based. I like that complete body of work, 
So I'm just kind of starting that process of like getting mentally prepared to work on this new album. Well, I'm not even hating on it. I'm I'm an album dude. Um, I like full projects. Uh, I totally get the the single format, mm -hmm. especially uh, in today's age. But yeah. I'm definitely also an album dude. Like I like to do full bodies of work, full projects. Um, right. So I totally feel that, man. Um, I think it's good to have downtime. Mm -hmm. uh, so you don't overload the brain. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I always have multiple things going on. So yeah, I run, I run two podcasts now. <clears throat> I think I got enough episodes of Denku podcast to where I can take a break with that and then just focus on putting those out. Right. Um, the Cypher Den has become a regular, which is dope. I like to do that. I like to get more, uh, you know, random, cool, dope feature guests involved that uh, that I haven't had on any type of podcast before. So it's dope to have you on. Um, Appreciate it. And uh, and yeah, but then aside from that, I mean, now I now I'm you know I got shows coming up. Mm -hmm. I got um. I mean, pestilence knows I'm sitting on probably like a a Tupac amount of music. <laughs> now nah, you work, man. You work <laughs> like I don't know if I've ever seen anyone work as consistently and as much as you. Like you have been doing this for a long, even before I actually met you. I've been seeing your name a lot, and okay. like. It's that is that is definitely something that I, I admire and I commend. Like your work ethic is without any kind of like there's no compare. Like you can't compare yourself to Danku's work ethic, man. It's it's crazy. <laughs> well, it's I appreciate crazy. I appreciate that to the fullest malls. Um no doubt. I mean, you know, my my you know, my homie Pestilence is starting to get his get his work ethic game on. I mean, he's definitely hungry. My homie over yeah. here. I've got a I've got a lot in the chamber and finally starting to get release plans for it. I got an EP coming out on Wednesday with Jester Exodus, just a little four track, but it's gonna be part of a larger project uh, where I'm just doing like small EPs relating to different cultures, uh, and I'm gonna pull them all together for a larger album called Around the World in 80 Minutes. I'm gonna use the whole 80 minutes on a CD for that one. Um, him and I just finished up a duo project called Ratness Regicide. Uh, we're going to release the name for the project soon. That's like a 17 track one. Um, I've got a full length album with DW Underground that we're working on the mixing and mastering of. Um, I'm most of the way through a project with Supreme to Almighty. And then I started another one with him and Mars. Uh, me and Mars one also have another EP that we got like six tracks for that we've been kind of plugging away at. Uh, and then I got another project with Tap Daddy Beats, so it's like slowly, yeah, slowly building up that See, that's, cypher that thing, I guess. That's the cypher then. That's the <laughs> yeah. It must be something in the water, man. I don't. I know love it. It's crazy. I love it. I love it, yo. <laughs> so, so you know, we had Cesar on here not too long ago. Mm -hmm. Um, you probably, I mean, I don't know if we actually talked about it, but I'm I'm curious because. I think you and him have told me how different the Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina hip hop scene is nowadays compared to when you first started doing yeah. hip hop shit. So I, I'm kind of curious to know that. I, yeah. I want to hear what type of differences are going on because I I'm assuming in some sense or some way it's similar to the Wisconsin or Milwaukee. Yeah. Scene, you know? it, it, it's probably a similar story everywhere. Um, now Cesar obviously has way more history than I do. I moved to Raleigh in 2010. Um, so, you know, he's been here a lot longer than I have. But when I first came to Raleigh, it was like 
all kinds of hip hop shows everywhere. Like no matter what style of hip hop you were into, there was something for you. There was a community for you. You a boom bap cat, you had your community. You know what I'm saying? You like more of the mainstream stuff, there was your community. And sometimes those crowds mingled together, you know, in, in certain things. And it was like venues upon venues. It's a college town, you know, we got all these schools here. Yeah. So it's gonna be a lot of venues here. Um, and it was just, you know, different weekly shows going down, you know what I'm saying? People throwing their own shows, people coming down here on tour. And then once I kind of started getting myself established, I was bringing people down here, um, you know, and, you know, they had venues that was like as small as like maybe 100, 100 people to like, you know, bigger and bigger venues that still catered to indie hip hop. Hmm. And then 2020 happened. And I remember I did a show with my man Eternal, I think it's his birthday bash it was maybe two or three days before like everything stopped mm -hmm. and once everything stopped you just started seeing like if I look on my Instagram feed and I follow a bunch of these venues in Raleigh like Deep South closed Southland Ballroom closed you know this place closed this place closed and it's like well damn like when we get off lockdown, like, where are we going to perform? Yeah, And, you know, things started opening up and like, there's no, there's no shows going on anymore. You know, like, as far as like, just straight indie bills going, you know, like, there'll be, you know, big artists coming and then somebody locally will open up for them. That's cool. That's dope. You know, um, obviously you've had the, the, um, little brother block party in durham um last summer going into fall um you had the justice league reunion uh, a couple of years ago you know so you'll have stuff like that but like if i want to throw a show now i'm like well shit what venue can i call you know there's really one venue like from back then that's left and that's the poor house and I even yeah, now, I've, I don't I've heard of that one. I've heard. Of yeah. That. Yeah. And, and I don't even see a lot of indie rap shows going down there. So I don't even know mm -hmm. how easy they are to book now anymore. Um, there's a, a group of guys, a group of producers out here called the Genius Party, and they're doing some really dope things, putting together, you know, these jams, um, producer showcase with like one or two rap acts. And they'll have them in like art museums and just all just kind of alternative spaces that aren't necessarily made for music as a music venue. So that's kind of been the workaround now. But like it's just such a stark contrast because I still have homies hitting me up like, yo, trying to get a show down there. And I'm like, good luck, bro. <laughs> like I'm not I'm yeah. not as tapped in as I used to be. Yeah, I mean, I. I still want to at some point. I don't know if it's going to ever really happen. I mean, anytime I play North Carolina, usually the spot that I end up getting is uh Asheville. Mm. They're still they're still pretty receptive. Um and I love that city. I, I actually I love it. Yeah, love Asheville is dope. And and they do um they do have, you know, some some things going on there. Um but, you know, Asheville is like uh 4 hours away from here. So um, it's the the scenes are completely different. <laughs> you know what I mean? As as far as like what goes on here and like, you know, Charlotte is like a whole different world, you know, as far as like their music yeah. scene as well. And I've, I've always Charlotte has been the hardest market for me in North Carolina to ever tap into. I've hit up so many spots. I even mm -hmm. hit up the people that used to do the weekly Mondays there. And like that shit stopped. And then they're kind of like, well, we, you know, we're not ever, we're not going back to that. That's never going to be a thing. So like, like you said, like, you know, and, and, and it's, it's unfortunate because there were so many moving parts going on before that whole shit happened. 
Like right. I was on the brink of doing more than I did in 2019. You know what I'm saying? Like 2019, I played 125 shows. Now, 2020, I had 36 shows booked in the first four months. I was on I was on the way to making yeah. it bigger. Mm-hmm. Then the shit happened. Had to cancel, I think, 31 of those because uh, I did play the five earlier on um, before the shutdown. Uh, I think I played four of those with uh, Microphone Misfits, so shout to them. That's the Chicago homies. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, But, yes, that shit happened. And like you said, a lot of during that time period, a lot of the venues that I even used to book at on tour and for artists coming into town are, are gone. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. but... it, it's, it's hard, man. And, and like, even when there are shows that, that do pop up and I show my face and it's, it's still not the same. Like people just, and it also could be, we kind of lost three years and we're, pretty much in the same age group. So like that's that's a lot for our, you know, demographic. Um a lot of people our age cuz we make music for people in our age group. We don't make music for the younger folks. Um like they're not trying to come out when a rap show is scheduled to start at 10 p.m. Mm, yeah. but doesn't actually start until midnight. You know, even if it's on a Friday or a Saturday, like 40, you 40 something years old, you ain't trying to be out that late like that anymore, you know? Um, and, and I totally get it. So like we lost that time and it's, you know, I hate to be just cynical and pessimistic. I'm like, but I do wonder, at, at least for the the triangle area, Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill, how can we get that back? And like I said, Genius Party, they are doing a fantastic job. You know, shout out to Ampersam, Ace Dizzy Flow, um, Millie Vaughn, all those guys. Like, I love what they're doing. Um, but they can't do it alone, mm. you know. And it, it's I, hopefully we can get back because, like, people used to come here from out of town and be like, man, I love the scene here. Like, yo, y'all are so hip hop. It's so dope. And you know, I felt pride in that because I felt like I was a part of that, you know, even though I've only been here since 2010. Um, but I would I would love to see that back. But it's just it's heartbreaking because it's like, oh, this venue is not open anymore. I don't even know who to contact, you know, in this place anymore. And, yeah, you know, so it, it's it's really hard to navigate now. Um, You were mentioning our age bracket and. uh what do you feel like, don't you think it's, I, I always thought it was super dope. I mean, Pestilence is, I don't even know how old Pestilence is. <laughs> be 30 in June. 30 in June. So he's younger, oh, man. way younger. Yeah. <laughs> so, so my thing is, but you got these 18, you have this, you, there's these people, there's these young kids between the age of 18 22 23 24 that are super hip hop yeah absolutely they that they they know they study the history they know the culture i mean how does that like does that happen from super hip hop parents like how are they so curious to want to go that direction instead of following the direction that their peers Mm -hmm. that do music, you know, they have their own thing. Why are they not following that? I I think it's a combination of things like, again, hip hop parents, because, you know, I don't have children myself, but like, we're the, you know, we are the parents, you know, like, we're the parents. So we came up in this. So, you know, just like when I was very young 
and my mom was in the car and she was listening to her music, I enjoyed it. You know, it's I think it's the same thing. And then also, just like us, when we were coming up, when we were in school, we had our friends that liked only what they heard on the radio. Mm. And like, I was like, yeah, that's cool. But, <laughs> you know, I like this thing that you probably have never heard of before. And I kind of like that better, you know, and I think that's always going to be there. You know, there's always going to be people who would go off the beaten path, would rather stay, you know, somewhere in left field and, and be a part of that niche. And it's really dope. And I think it's way easier now than any time before, because you can get the music. Yeah. Anywhere. The information, the music, all that. Right. All you right can. There you can tap in directly with the people who are making it. You know, like when I was coming up, I'm from a really small town and we had a radio station. Um, we got, I'm from Northeastern North Carolina, but it's so small and so country. Our TV and radio stations were from Southeastern Virginia. So we would get stuff from Norfolk, Virginia, Portsmouth, Newport News, Virginia mm. beach, stuff like that. So like we had a radio station and a couple of DJs, they had DJs from up north, cool DJ Law, rest in peace, um, DJ B, like, that had mix shows. If it wasn't for that, then I would probably only know the stuff that most people knew at the time. Like, I wouldn't have heard Company Flow mm -hmm. in high school if it wasn't for those mix shows. And, like, you didn't really, I didn't have, we didn't have cable growing up. So I didn't get to see Rap City and, and you know what I'm saying? Yo, I did see Young TV Raps back in like 88, 89, because we lived somewhere else that had cable. But for the most part, I never saw those videos. But now, like, yeah. it's all around you. You can find it easily. You probably don't even have to look for it. Yeah, you can find now. all the all the MTV Rap episodes on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. So I think it's a lot easier now for he, for younger people to find a niche subgenre of you know this music that we love and go deep diving and exploring that rabbit hole i think it's easier now than when we were coming up you know like we had the source magazine later on double xl you know and we might have it might have been a small ad for you know this boutique record label and stuff and it was like oh man i gotta find that and you go to the record <laughs> store and ask if they had it and they don't know what it is, you know? And so it's, I think it's easier for them to kind of be into boom bap. Yeah. You know, it's more accessible. Pestilence, you got, you got anything to touch on that? Yeah, man. I think greatness transcends the, the clutches of time. It's the same reason why Bach and Beethoven and Mozart and Van Gogh and fucking all these other Edgar Allan Poe, all these lost artists from, you know, years and years and years ago are still beloved and, you know, well-respected today because if it's solid quality, um, something that can connect to a lot of people, it's going to find its way to the surface. You know, I mean, it's like, obviously it did have to reach a certain reach at some point, but it's like, you think about boom bap, it's like, man, there was a time in the nineties, the eighties, even the early two thousands where it's like, that was everywhere. You know, and it's like, so that has made a giant cultural impact on a lot of people. It's not going to go away. You know, it doesn't matter if it's not in the mainstream. It doesn't matter if it gets kind of led astray from, you know, anything that you see on TikTok and all these other platforms. It's going to keep finding its way to, to seep through because a lot of, um, you know, what it did made such a giant impact on humanity when it was at its peak. Um, that's never going to go away. Like you just, it'll never go away. It's the same as those other things to me, because it's like, man, some of these things totally change the course of human history through a genre of music, you know, and that's, you can't go back and rewrite that. That already happened. So it's going to keep finding its way through. People are always going to be curious about how did this come to be? Where did this come from? And when you look down the paths, even if you're looking at something completely different, that's not boom bap, say you look at, I mean, a good one we were talking about the other day was that that lady that got on that was, you know, she was on a podcast or something. And the lady says, you know, so you're a musician. 
And the girl was so dumb that she's like, I ain't a, I ain't a magician. Like she was all mad that she was getting called a musician. If you are like, how did this lady come to be famous? Where did she come from? It's like, even though it's for worse, that still stems from hip hop originally. So it's like, if I'm curious, I never heard of any of this stuff. And I look into her and I follow the trail all the way back. It's going to make me go like, how the fuck did we get here? But still, where did we start from? We started from, you know, the the original DJs, the block parties, the people freestyling in the streets, you know, the the NWAs, the Run DMCs, the, you know, the Cool G Raps, all these guys coming up and, and inspiring entire generations. Like it did, it has gone through so many different changes and evolutions and down different paths, but that's where it started. So it's it's always going to be around. Yeah, I feel that. Um, you know, I saw this crazy thing today. Um, just scrolling the socials, and I'm curious on your guys' opinions on it. I so okay, so it also stems back. I remember I I actually watched the Grammys this year, and I remember a lot of the a lot of the talk in the Grammys this year were about how, um. And women are killing it this year in music and uh women are killing it this year in hip hop. Where where to where to what what's up, fellas? Where y'all at? Like the, the women are taking over in, in the hip hop shit. Here's the thing. There's a lot of dope lady MCs. There's even I would even put Sal Rock and Rod Digger, two of my favorites, probably in a top 25 of all time potentially like lyrically they're cold they're on that level maybe even rap city she's cold you know what i'm saying those three <clears throat> to me stand out they could be in the overall all time but that's not the shit that is winning people over and getting awards now the shit that's getting awards and winning people over is this terrible, whack fucking representation of women. Like, you got Ice Spice. You got Sexy Red. You got artists like this. I just saw this post today saying Ice Spice. I, I, even, I think it was Double XL, actually, that posted it, saying Ice Spice now has her sex tape going viral. I'm like, what? This is what? And, and like, she knows about it. And she's pushing that shit. I'm like, that's, but, and that's, that's the, the, the role model. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't understand how women are killing it, but it's the negative role model even though there's a lot of women that want the positive role model for women you know what i'm saying like i don't understand how that gets jumbled and we don't put more of the sarak or rod digga or rap city or you know i mean there's a there's a ton there's a ton of really dope lyrical female mcs but why are those not the ones that we talk about more? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I think that, like, first of all, I don't think this is anything new, right? Like, no, 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 it's not at all. It's not. Yeah, like you know, and I think that, like, it, it all boils down to the fact that it's the suits who kind of have the money to put behind stuff like that. And they know how to sell that, you know, like they know how yeah. to sell that to, you know, the, the masses and, you know, they act like they don't know how to sell a Rhapsody, a Rhapsody or a Saw Rock or, you know, whoever, you know, like, I, I I listen to like, you know, hip hop interviews or just music interviews all the time. And it'll be like this kind of unsung artist 
um, in whatever genre. And it'll they'll have like this critically acclaimed album and they'll say, yeah, but the record label didn't know how to market it. Like, how do you not know how to market it? That's your job. Figure it out. You know, I, I think that is kind of the, the thing why you don't see people, you know, like the Rod Diggers and, and all those people being celebrated on that level as the, you know, Sexy Reds or the Kim and Foxes back in the day. Like, if it was, you know, the art people who got to make those kinds of decisions and, you know, then you would see a greater variety of, you know, rappers in general, regardless of, you know, mm. gender or whatever. Um, and it's probably an unpopular opinion with, you know, my, I guess my type of hip hop, but like, I don't even mind the sexy reds and the ice spices because they don't make music for me. You know, yeah, no, they don't. Right. Like, I'm not the audience. Like, so I'm not worried about it. <laughs> um, and they have the right to exist in what they're doing. But like you said, when you have equally talented artists or more talented artists, um, that it seems to be an uphill battle for them. Like, it doesn't seem fair and it's not fair. And like, you know, if we wanted something fair, the music industry ain't it oh, yeah. <laughs> on any no. level. No. You know no. what I mean? Um, but I just think it's because people, the the people in the suits say, well, we don't know how to market this. We don't know how to sell this. Who is the audience? Like, clearly it's someone because, you know, a guy from Wisconsin and a guy from North Carolina both like the same rappers and we both found them somehow. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. so it can be done, you know, but when it comes to like these, you know, a, even though labels kind of really aren't a thing like they were before, but when it comes to like these labels and these people in power who, you know, can make people rise like that, like, they don't have time to try to figure out how to sell, you know, uh, a Moo Moo Fresh. You know, they don't have time to figure out how to do that. Like, they see Sexy Red, they see Ice Spice, they're like, oh, I could do this easily. Boom, we can make bank. And yeah, it's the path of Leafs resistance. And that's kind of how I feel like it boils down to, because if there was, like, if rap, if this album at Rhapsody is um, about to put out, if it somehow, you know, because she got, she got, she kind of got a big machine behind her now. Yeah. Um, if it somehow cracks that glass ceiling or whatever and gets to get on the level of like she's the rap Beyonce now you best believe all these other people are going to be looking for the next rap scene you know they're going to be looking for the next super lyrical super dope rapper yeah you know it's just that's what's easy for them to market I think it's about control and I think it's the same reason why like the like TikTok. So TikTok in the US, you pull that up, it's nonstop videos of the dumbest shit that you can find. Then you go to China and you open up TikTok, it's like a bunch of educational videos. And it's like it's the same reason they're trying to ban it here is that like it's they're trying to make the United States population dumber. Like China as like a Chinese thing is like, hey, let's make them all you know more stupid. I think that our fucking infrastructure wants the same thing or has for many years they don't want revolutionaries it's not that they can't sell holy shit can they sell but they do not want them to sell because if you sell revolutionary ideas you change the core foundation of everything that these people in power know and everything that they do if you start to light the spark and give it to mankind the people in power are fucked so I don't think they ever want to put a Rhapsody, a Sabrak, a Raw Digger in the very top of the spotlight. Because if they do that, they risk everything that they hold true. Because you bring somebody that's going to actually talk about what the fuck is happening and you give them a big enough platform to talk about it. Damn, now you fucked up. Like, I don't think they'll mm -hmm. ever do that. But you get Sexy Red talking about her asshole. That ain't fucking what they're doing. 
that ain't screwing up what they're doing. They can keep collecting that check. They still make the money. Like you said, it's easy for them to market. People still buy it. So why do they care if, you know, it's making the people more stupid? If it's making the people more stupid, it means they get to hold power even longer. Because the less intelligent the population is, the easier it is to subdue them. That's what I think it all boils down to at the end of the day. For, at least it personally, that's what I think it is. No, that's that's facts though. That's facts. I that reminds me of like, you know, a few years back, I remember I would let coworkers hear my music or whatever. And they're, you know, they'll say, like, oh, this reminds me of a tribe called Quest. I used to love them. How come they don't make that anymore? Like they do. You're literally listening to it right now. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like you liked it when this was available to you. You know, you gravitated towards it when it was available to you. Now it's no longer available to you. So you're gravitating towards this other thing and you're pining and you're longing for that sound that you don't think exists anymore, but it does. You know? And even more abundance, too, because like right. they inspire you, they inspire me, they inspire somebody else. It's like there's even more motherfuckers making that kind of music than ever before. It's just there isn't there isn't as much of a push from a larger investment standpoint. There isn't as much of a money machine working behind them because like you said, those labels aren't around in the same way. At least when there was labels with money that were pushing artists, you'd get some people like that that would break through and would be able to reach more. And now it's like, now that there's not really that part, you've gone to streaming, you've gone to more of like a commercial marketing, it's going to get harder and harder for the people that are saying real things to start to be able to find a platform to say it. So do you think, yeah. so do you think that the, like someone like Immortal Technique, do you think that he just, they fucked up and he accidentally made his way in and now they're like, how do we eliminate this this political revolutionary threat like it like is is that is that what you think happened like someone like immortal technique or i mean there's there's a lot there's a lot of them that that talk real shit i mean public enemy back in the day mm -hmm. was talking that real shit so you think there was somebody that wanted to get that message across that was in the right place at the right time that was able to catapult those people into that position. And then these other people are like, whoa, who the fuck did this? Why mm -hmm. did this happen? Like that yeah. is, is, is yeah, that what to, some, to, some, to some degree, I think so. But I also think it's like a, they didn't think about it until it was too late situation. It was like a, they saw, like you said, the dollar signs. And it was like, Ooh, this guy's talented. This guy's marketable. Let's put him on a stage. Mm. And then they did. And then they're like, they started listening to what he's saying. Because like, if you, the, when I think about it this way, like I think about hip hop music and I think about like the, you know, the fucking old white men in power, like all those fucking people, they, they listen to a hip hop song, even the fucking most eloquent MCs of all time, them just brushing through it. They don't fucking know what the guy's saying. They think he's speaking gibberish. They're like, oh, I just an auctioneer up there. I don't fucking know what he's saying. They don't care. So I think that's what happened is I think you had some people that were like, this is going to sell. This is holy shit. This is something unique and different. Let's get them up there. And then somebody picked it apart and said, do you realize what they're fucking saying? Like, we can't have this. We don't want this, <laughs> you know, but like what they're doing is making us money. Let's find a way to have people do it, but not be talking about anything that's going to change the status quo and what's going on. Let's find some people to talk about their body let's find some people to talk about drugs let's find some people to talk about addiction you know not in a like a cultivative way but to glorify it let's find that because if we find that we really knuckle down on these these people that are being inspired by them you know mm -hmm. we don't want black thought up there we don't want tribe called quest we don't want a mortal technique we don't want you know Ari the rugged man we don't want Tayamu denku we don't want these people out there spreading a message that message could totally destroy and derail the track that we have our train on that we're just, you know, railroading the public with. It's like money is the be all end all for so many fucking people. And it holds back society in, in the biggest way. It, it has, 
if money wasn't a and really it, it doesn't make sense now especially when you talk about how far technology has come and what we talked about earlier with bernie talking about like hey man like technology has come to a point where we can we don't have to struggle anymore to work hard we can kind of find a good balance and maybe start discovering new shit because we'll have more time and more energy to to put spend in other areas you know it's like that kind of stuff could start a second renaissance and it's like but then they have less you know worker bees that are just following a leader you know and, and less people following them and just listening without questioning and that's it's dangerous it's dangerous for the people that are profiting off of it right now yeah absolutely pastor i, I for real thought that when we when you were given the Bernie Sanders example that you were going to switch in and like change your whole voice to sound like Bernie or something. Oh man. I haven't done a good, <laughs> I haven't done a Bernie in a long time. I didn't I even think you, about I thought it. you were going to flip it on him, man. I thought you were going to flip it on him. <laughs> oh, I gotta, I gotta work on that one again. If Bernie's <laughs> making a comeback. I gotta work on that one again, man. Word up, word up. So malls, um, like I said, we uh we had Cesar on here as well. I had initially met you through Cesar. Um, you were on tour with him. So I don't know that whole story. Mm-hmm. How does that connection happen? How do you end up touring with Cesar? Uh, I mean, multiple times, basically. Yeah. So I gotta make sure I can go back far enough there was a show i believe it was at the black flower um it was a small you know venue in raleigh really small venue and um it was i believe it was cesar ghost dog maybe a couple other guys and i think at the time cesar was also working on like a web series with these guys like a comedy kind of like a dark comedy web series Mm. and I was there and because I was I'm cool with Ghost Dog you know he kind of did the formal introductions um and I got in the scene and like they didn't tell me they didn't give me any dialogue or anything they just kind of told me to react and in certain times, if you just tell me to say whatever, I might say some wild shit. Like, I'm I'm really laid back, but like, if I kind of get in that mode, I could say some really wild shit, you know? Hey. And I said some wild shit, and everybody laughed and shit, and um, you know, it was kind of cool, you know, me and Cesar and Ghost Dog all vibed. It was like, okay, this is a cool dude. Um, we went on to kind of film a few more episodes of that web series or whatever. And then like later on, um, Cesar just hit me out of the blue. He was like, Hey man, what are you doing? in?" I think it was like early summer. What are you doing early summer, man? And I was like, I got nothing going on trying to go on the road, do a couple of shows. We went down to Florida. Um, I was like, yeah. And that was my first time, like going on an actual tour where it was multiple dates, you know, outside of my state or even my region, you know? Um, And like, we kind of, we had a a good chemistry as far as like, you know, if I don't know if you've ever toured with someone else because I know you hit the road solo dolo. I I have, and you have have to have a a chemistry with people you tour with or it's terrible. Absolutely. Like, um, I think it was Fonte said, if you want to get to know who someone is, you either go on the road with them or you live with them, you know, like, you can't hide shit on the road, you know? So like, it was just a real cool, it was a fun time, you know? Like, you know, he he digs my music. I've always dug his music and shit. And like, I knew how to handle myself. And and probably more importantly to Cesar, he saw what I was doing on my own first. He saw that I was putting shows on, I was putting in the work. So it wasn't like, you know, those people that try to get on tour with you and just want you to do all the work. And then they just get on and rap for 15 minutes and then just chill, you know, like he saw the work that I put in. Um, And so all of that, he just kept saying like, Hey, we're going on the road this time. You good? Yep. I'm good. You know? And that's kind of how it all started. Like 
And, you know, it's um, there's a few people that I credit that kind of put me that made me kind of the, the the malls that people know today. And Cesar is definitely on that list as far as like teaching me about going on tour, going on the road and not blowing all your money, eating out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. blowing all your show yeah. money, yeah, eating yeah. fast food or whatnot, like go to the grocery store, get you some food, fucking cook, you know, if you can, while you're on the road, like, you know, mm -hmm. and, and things like that, that just makes it That's a good. lot better experience for you. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's he's the person that basically, I mean, you have one too. I mean, I've I never had a fucking display rack. Say mm -hmm. got me on that shit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, man, he's definitely uh, good people's man. Um, and like I said, glad to have met you touring with him. I mean, me and you are cool now. Mm -hmm. Um, explain this background though, because this. <laughs> this shit hey yo i thought that looked familiar but i didn't oh, want yeah. to say nothing to be like mad arrogant like yo did i draw that like, yeah you drew no, this you didn't drew that. this is you son <laughs> you did this shit. yeah man i um i started out as an art nerd um like you know what I'm saying my mom she used to doodle and stuff all the time my brother was a really good artist like he mostly he, he was in the cars so he liked to draw cars and i'm the younger brother so I always wanted to do what my big brother did. He's the reason why I got into rap, you know? So I would try to draw. And then when I was around eight, nine, 10 years old, I found comic books, drawing comic books. You know what I'm saying? And like, um, I was always that guy in school who was like, you know, oh, can Jay draw me a picture? And I just, you know, draw whatever and charge people a little, you know, five, $10 for this stuff. Um, when I went to college, I went for art. Um, and that was a disaster. So I changed my major to a useless psychology degree. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I understand the art disaster. I also yeah. was an art major. Yeah. Art school is wild. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah. And so I kind of have a weird relationship with it. Um, I still love art. Like I go to art museums all the time, but like, as far as like mm. actually drawing now, I have a weird relationship with it. Like I got the idea to start drawing for my merch a couple of years ago. I'm like, okay, you know, most of the shows that I go to are kind of bar situations. So maybe not everyone there is there ex specifically to see me rap. But if they see this cool ass picture of Spider-Man, you know, that might draw them in, uh, no pun intended. So I just started like drawing and like, it's one of those things like it's a muscle man. If you don't use it like that, it atrophies. And like, yeah, the drawings that I did before that one, <laughs> like, it, it took a it took a while to kind of gain that muscle memory back, man. So now, like, every time I go on, I have a show. I try to do at least like um, doing a, a a mad the mad villain album cover. That one sells a lot. So like, I was thinking about should I just do print so I won't have to keep drawing this over and over? But I do like, one, the practice of it, and two, just that everyone who has one will have a different one. You well, know, I kind of dig I that. I mean, like I said, this is cold, man, because, Thank I mean, you. it's, you know, it's it's the actual art piece, and then it's got your signature on it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I've, yeah. I've turned into this fucking, I don't know what happened. The pandemic happened. Mm -hmm. And I turned into this fucking collector of shit. <laughs> and now I have like all these fucking collector item things. Like if I turn my camera right now, you see over here, I got this fucking signed master ace picture over here. Like that's dope. I got, I got uh Cheech and Chong Simpsons signed <laughs> frame picture downstairs. Like, just, Danko, I'm about to give you a concept for an album cover that you're going to fucking love. Oh, it's you standing in that outfit, you know, like you got his outfit on and you got all your shit, all your like toys and stuff. And it's you as the collector. It's like, uh -huh. the collector. <laughs> that's, dope. that's dope. Yeah, That will yeah. be dope. That will be dope. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Maybe, maybe that will be a, a album and a concept. That's, that's nice. That's nice. Right <laughs> Um, 
Yeah, man. Do you have a um? We've done multiple shows, me and you, malls mm-hmm. together. We've done. We did the run. Uh, with you and Cesar, the the Wisconsin Minnesota run. Yeah. Um. Right. And then mm-hmm. we did. Uh, some earlier show because you, because I brought you all back. Yeah, yeah, we we went and, up there twice. But I did another show with you, yes. So, out of the shows that we've all done together, even if it's not something you remember at the show with me, is yeah. there something that stands out from those tour runs, like a story? Something funny, <laughs> something good. You know, I, I, I so, want to hear a story. Okay, so oh man, there uh, it's so many, and it's so weird because like a lot of stories are kind of had to be there type of stories, but um, it's not necessarily one from when we went up to to rock with you, but I do remember it might have been my either my first or I think it was my second time going down to Florida. Uh, me, Cesar Comanche, Poe Mac. I can't mm, remember if Ghost Dog was. Mac. Yeah, shout out to Poe Mac. Um, can't remember if Ghost Dog was was with us or not. But we were in. Oh man, where was I? Think it might have been Daytona. And <laughs> Daytona is a fun, crazy place. Yes, it is. And so, who was it? Um, I think Poe Mac was performing. He was on stage. Me and Cesar chilling at the merch table, whatnot. And there was like a window at the venue. And we saw this huge dude, like Mark Henry, just huge dude. <laughs> like, <laughs> and he was, he was pissed. I don't know what happened, but he was like, no, <laughs> fuck that. Fuck that. I'm fucking somebody up. And it was like, oh shit. Oh <laughs> shit. And somehow he wandered into the venue and he just had that look and like, you do that like it just got super quiet in there even though Pomac is still performing like it's like oh shit something's about to go down like it might have to be like the old west where the damn piano player packs his shit up and fucking leaves like but Pomac is still up there rocking dude is up there he I, I guess he was looking for somebody who but he was like yo you seen blah 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 yo I'm about to fuck him up blah 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 and Pomac still rocking and this dude Music calms the savage motherfucker because this dude fell in love with Poe Mac. Like, this man forgot he was mad at anybody. He was up there rocking with Poe Mac like, yeah. Poe Mac got off stage. This man, I, I think he bought like all the shit that Poe Mac had. Oh, like, shit. This dude forgot about whatever the fuck it was that pissed him off and had him scary as fuck. Like, he just turned into a normal guy. He might have shrunk a few sizes like it, it was just wild like i've never seen anything like that before in my life yo like oh, that dude shit. i'm pretty sure that dude is still a fan of poe mac to this day like that was that was wild um we've <laughs> hey, seen some man real quick man you know what's funny about daytona man um i've only played there one time but when i went down there um it was that thing. So driving down the main strip. <clears throat> I actually have multiple stories about Daytona. That's how crazy it was. Like <laughs> usually usually you have like one story from each location. Right. Like Daytona has multiple fucking stories, right? And at, at this time, um, you know, I was down there on tour, and this was a tour I brought uh amy with me right Mm -hmm. and we were we were down there and i remember driving down the main strip and we're driving down that strip we see the daytona beach sign it's all like oh man it's what we see in the movies like it's yeah and then like literally there's these people on these motorcycles that like they're like driving and then this fucking car like cuts them off Right. And this is like mid drive. So we're like driving. And then like this car cuts these motorcycle people off. And then I, I'll never forget. We're like 
driving next to this car that cut these people off. And then these motorcycles just pull up and surround the car and start banging on the car while we're fucking driving. I thought it was going to be like some, like some road rage, like road rage, the video game or something. Right, right, right. You know what I'm saying? Like that's one thing that happened, right? Then get to the hotel. The hotel is under renovation for fucking hurricane shit, right? Wow. So got it mad cheap, but it's right on the beach. So it's super dope. Mm-hmm. But um and then find out that it's under renovation hardcore to a point where someone got stuck in the elevator. Not in the elevator where he's stuck and they need to call someone to get him out. Like his body is stuck in the door, bro. <laughs> Yeah. In the door. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh my God. And then I feel like Daytona Beach, just the island strip area before you go into the town where the fucking racetrack is and shit. Mm-hmm. That island area probably has the most strip clubs I've ever seen on a single block in my entire life. Absolutely. Absolutely. Florida is different. I used to live in Florida for a little bit. Florida is different. Like, it's wild different. I do remember this might have been one of the times that we went up your way. Um, We did a show in, um, I want to say it was Indiana. I think so. And the hotel, the hotel we stayed at was um not in the nicest areas, but there was a <laughs> bunch of strip clubs around this hotel. And apparently this is the hotel where the strippers kind of oh, yeah. reside for One a of little those. bit. One yeah, of yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and say it was after the show, Cesar and I came back and I didn't realize that like this is where the strippers chill at until we came through the lobby and I was like, oh, well, she ain't wearing a whole lot of clothes for this weather. You know, like this is is cheeks out and stuff, but okay, all right, get it in. (laughs) And so we go and it's like, okay, strippers are here, strip clubs, that makes sense. And for some reason I go back out, I think I was trying to get some ice or something. And one of the strippers is is a really fucked up story, but it's just the randomness of it. One of the strippers is down in the lobby talking to the lady and she is in a motherfucking panic. And apparently she left her kid in the room with some of her coworkers. And the coworkers and the kid got missing. They were not in the room when she got back. From her shift, I guess. Fuck? Yes. And I'm like, yo, what is happening here? And I came back to her. I was like, yo, Cesar, we may or may not be in the midst of a kidnapping right now. Like, that shit was wild. And we're never going to book that hotel again. <laughs> like, that's <laughs> that, was, that was enough for me, man. Like, I just, nah, bro, you're not stealing that no kids crazy. on my watch, man. Like, it, it was wild. I, I hope she found her kids. I hope they just went out to Waffle House for some food and yeah, that's crazy. came back okay. That's crazy. But that was wild. Damn, man. Yeah. Damn. Yeah, that was... It's it's like you see some wild shit going yeah, out when, on the road. Oh, yeah. When you Yo. tour, you see the craziest shit ever, man. You see... it. it it's, it's so much fun, but you see literally the craziest shit that you've ever seen in the world. Right, right. Like, like you see shit that, like, you thought only movies had that shit. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Pestilence Yo, is ready. Pestilence is ready. <laughs> Thank you. This ain't a tourist story, but it's, it's it makes me laugh every time I think about it. And, like, me and, me and Space talked about this for, like, a week after it happened. So we were both just like, man, I don't know what the fuck that was. 
the first time that I ever did a show with you up in Sturgeon Bay at the Nautical, Space had booked you. And it was like, I can't remember the full bill, but I think it was like me, Space Case, as you were there, and Jason Logic was there. And you were set up on the back with your merch, and Jason Logic was set up next to you with his merch. And you guys both just like, everybody else kind of, you know, mingling around and doing stuff. You and Jason both stood at your tables for most of the show until you guys were performing. And you guys are you're like, you know, you're doing the Dinkle arm fold, you know, fucking Logic is holding his shit down. Like, and they're both named Jason. So, like, they're both standing at their tables, and, and we're kind of looking like, damn, like, shit, they're both from Milwaukee, too. Like, then I said to Space, I was like, yo, do, do they have beef? And he's like, man, I don't know. I, like, it kind of looks like it, though. He's like, they're both just, like, kind of holding down, like, it was like a battle of the territory. And then, like, after, I don't know, I don't remember who, I think he asked Jason Logic, because at the time, like, we didn't know you that well. So he's just like, yo, do you, you know, do you? he's like, no, I've never met Deku before. Like, and you, you guys didn't even know each other, but we're like, all three of us swore, was like, man, these guys are like, these guys are going to fight back here. Because, like, just the demeanor <laughs> seemed like, it was just like the fucking hip-hop, like, fucking like, I'm holding my spot, I'm holding my spot. And then afterwards, like, you know, the next show that we saw you guys both at, you guys dapping each other up and stuff, and it was like, nah, we didn't even know each other. And, like, neither of you even, like, had any of that same inclination. It was just, like, all three of us, though, were like, oh, shit, man, like, those guys must not like each other. I was like, oh, bro, you fucked up. They're both from the same city, dude. What if they're, like, <laughs> fucking mortal enemies? Like, they're both Jasons from the same city, spelled differently. It's fucking I-N versus O-N up in here, like. It's like Highlander. Oh, no. There can only be one. Yeah, it's like dude, you're, spelling your, you're spelling our name wrong. No, you're spelling our name wrong, bro. Bro, it's funny you said the Denku arm folds. <laughs> yeah, that's why I laugh. You know exactly I, like, I know it. I know it. <laughs> oh shit! So, Mars, I want your your opinion on this. Recently, okay. um, my homie Pestilence has uh, ruffled some feathers. Um, in the online rap world, because he and the Two Face Media homies decided to do this thing where they broke down constructively the wackest versions of the multiple feature buying songs. Mm. And the th the thing about it is they basically just told their truthful opinions on it. And it's all opinion, right? Right. But they gave their truthful opinions and constructive criticism breakdowns of the songs. And people got butthurt about it. Do you think there's a big problem with people in hip hop probably more hip hop than other music genres that can't handle constructive criticism <laughs> yeah there um i had this conversation <laughs> saturday um i i think it's i think it's probably more Maybe not even more prevalent in hip hop, but at least it's more heard about in hip hop, maybe because that's what I primarily deal with. But people don't like criticism, constructive or otherwise, in general. You know, in general, like, you know. Um, but I think in rap and hip hop culture, since the hater has been invented, <laughs> criticism and constructive criticism <laughs> has kind of taken so much more of like a bad connotation, you know? And like, it, it's hard because it's like, I get the whole Erica Badu, I'm an artist and I'm sensitive about my shit, but also like, if I put out some shit, and Danko, you're my man. So if you hit me up like a hey, Malls, this ain't it, bro. Yeah, but that's the thing. That's the thing about it, though. Homie to homie, 
I respect certain people's opinions or breakdowns or constructive criticism. Right. Because we're on the even plane level. And I wouldn't just be like, this ain't it. I would give you a breakdown of why this ain't it. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. like, when you do shit like that, I don't find that as even, like, yes, artists are sensitive about their shit. I don't find that as hurtful when you break it down mm -hmm. to where an artist could kind of understand what might not be, you know, that certain thing that needs to be tweaked or something yeah. different. Yeah. And um but like I th I don't know man it's like the quality control aspect of hip hop mm -hmm. has been long gone. Yeah, yeah. And it's like like I get it. You know, I know that everything ain't for everybody. Hell, on you know, a subtle reminder, the first single I led with is probably my most divisive song that I've come out with since I've been releasing music on my own. Come again, like people either hated it, it was like, why did you do this? Or people that like, yes, this is what I've been wanting from you the whole time. You know, like mm. I got I got homies that I've known over 20 years that's like, yeah, I don't like that shit. <laughs> like, I don't like oh, that shit at all. You know, and it, like, I respect it. Like, you ain't, like, I know that every song I write ain't the greatest song ever. Like, that's just, I put out too much shit for all my shit to be fucking, you know, five mic classics. Like, I'm not that delusional. You know what I mean? So, like, I could respect it. Everything ain't for everybody. Like, but I do think it's something to be said and like you say, who it's coming from and how that criticism is delivered. <clears throat> Some people don't necessarily know how to do it. Like my like my homie said that didn't like it, he was like, yeah, I don't like that one. You should have, nah, you should have, you shouldn't have did that. Like, and that that's just how own, he is. But that was his only breakdown. He didn't actually. Yeah, that was all he, that was all he had. But that's kind of how he is with most things, right? It's like, yeah. I don't like it, you know? And I'm pretty sure he has his specific reasons that he could tell me, but I, I've been knowing him long enough that I'm like, I get it. I know, I know, I know his tastes. So I know why he wasn't rocking with that one, you know? Mm. Um, and, you know, it's a fine line because as an artist, you gotta be strong enough to kind of stand on your shit, but also be open enough to know that like, okay, maybe I can look at this from a different perspective, you know, like, Maybe this line, because there is nothing that anyone can say to me about my music that is worse than what I would say about it. You know, like th I have a lot of songs that will never see the light of day. Hmm. Like I, I did a song. I got um, my homeboy DJ A to the L to do cuts on it. He was, you know, giving me shit. He was like, yeah, you know, at least you released that one and didn't release the one I did. I was like, honestly, that shit was trash. <laughs> like the song was trash it was not a good song and i'm not putting that shit out you know um <laughs> but like i learned a long time ago that like people don't really care for that because like i used to be like me and my homeboys they used to call we were stedler and waldorf from the fucking muppets in the balcony fucking heckling motherfuckers on stage you know and when people would get off stage i'd be like hey you know you might want to move around on stage or like don't keep your eyes closed the whole time. Just trying to give them, you know, some some tips to yeah. like, you know, people came out here to see you, man. Like, or even if they didn't come out to see you, you would want them to come to see you the next time. Like, make them feel a part of something. Stop rapping at people, you know? Let me, um, can, let, can, let me pause you real quick because you telling me that heckling on the balcony shit made me think of this heckling story. I just want to tell it real quick because it's one of the craziest things I ever witnessed in my life. I was at this show in Philly. This isn't something that happened to me or nothing that I had anything to do with. But I was I was in Philly for a cipher. Went to this show on an off day. Um, at this uh, venue called The Fire. I've actually played there uh, not long ago. But um, 
cool, grimy hip hop spot. And there was this dude that was, he was sitting down. He literally brought a chair into the fucking, like where the fans are. He brought a chair there while this guy <laughs> was performing. And he sat down in the middle of the crowd in a chair. And he's just pointing at this dude and he's laughing. Right. And this and, guy ruled. Bro, wait till you, hold hold on. <laughs> <laughs> pointing at him, he's laughing while the guy's rhyming on stage. And then the guy gets off stage and then they have some words with each other. They go outside. My homie, um, one of my homies had his Lexus truck parked in front. The dude that got heckled that was on stage literally grabbed the heckler by his head and smashed his head so hard into the side of the Lexus door, it left a dent <laughs> so fucking big in the Damn. car. And then the dude just walked home. <laughs> the heckler. What could you do? Like, <laughs> like... Just put your head through a car door. Like, yeah. well, I guess I hit the dusty trail. Time to go like, home. Dusty... Yeah. Time to go home. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, sorry Fuck to interrupt your statement. No, no, that was fucking golden. Think, it made me think <laughs> of that crazy shit I saw. Right. And, and I think, like, because so many people, because to be an artist is to, like, no matter what kind of art you do, you are putting yourself, a piece of yourself out there to be critiqued. And mm. some people can't handle that. And they take it personally, you know? And yeah, I get it. Cause you know, the first time people were saying, you know, things that weren't glowing reviews of my music, like that shit hurt. But like, you do it long enough you're going to develop a, it's going to scab over. You're going to develop a tough skin. Yeah. And like, mm -hmm. I think that like, you need to have those dissenting views to balance shit out because it's like, yo, everything you do ain't it. Like you can like, you know, whoever your favorite rapper is, I'm pretty sure there is at least one song or maybe even one verse where you're like, yeah, we don't talk about that one. Oh, you know, dude, or maybe in the whole it. album, we're like, right? We don't, we don't talk about that one. <laughs> like, you know, Rakim, that album, The Master, we don't talk about that one. I wasn't a fan <laughs> of it. The Man, worst Luke album Ken, art. We don't talk about that one. Yeah, you know, there's definitely everyone has a record. Yeah, record. so it's like you're not. No artist is above critique. You know, no. and it's unfortunate that like we have this fucking, you know, even though people don't necessarily say you're a hater, but that that whole attitude is still very prevalent. You know, oh, yeah, people do still say it. Yeah, I heard you it know, many times yesterday. And and it's, it's and I think there's also a difference of knowing when that shit is coming from a good place. Like whenever I've told people about stuff, as a matter of fact, great example. And I was talking about this Saturday. Um, the one time I listened to someone's music unsolicited on Facebook, this was years ago. I don't even know who the person was, but apparently they seen me at a show because y'all know I don't really fuck with Facebook like that. Um, they saw me at a show. They reached out to me. It was like, hey, could you listen to my song? Usually that shit gets ignored. Like, you don't yeah. say shit. You just throw a fucking MP3 at me. Like, the fuck is wrong with you? Um, So I listened to it, and they're like, what do you think? And I was like, I don't like it. And they asked, well, why? I was like, I don't like your rhymes. I don't like what you're rapping about. The beat is terrible. You don't have really good presence on the mic. And that motherfucker unfriended the fuck out of me. <laughs> 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 but it's like, I mean... I get that I could come off very curt and I'm I'm just direct. You know what I mean? Especially when it's somebody that I don't really have that kind of relationship with. 
You know what I'm saying? Like, if you if you sent me your joint, it was like, yo, Mars, listen to this. Tell me what you think. And if I wasn't feeling it, I'd be like, hey, man, this ain't as strong as some of your other joints. I think maybe if you blah, blah, blah. You know, that's coming from a good place. That's coming yeah. from somebody who wants to see you succeed and be your best self at all times. You yeah, know? I, w- I wouldn't in my mind be like, oh, that's a hater statement. Right, exactly. And I think that, you know, for younger artists, because I feel like it's not as much of an issue with people who've been doing it as long as we have. Um, with younger artists, you got to, A, learn who is just saying some bullshit and who's actually trying to put you on game. And I, then... Quick, I, think, I, think it's, I think it's a, it's a mesh be- of younger artists and inexperienced artists. That's it. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's perfect. You know, with the inexperienced artists, because there are younger artists who like are very like, um, not the fucking name drop, but like, um, there's a dude um around here named Pat Junior. He just won a Grammy for working with Lecrae for like Christian mm. hip hop joint. I remember when the first times he when he kind of first came out here and was doing shows and stuff. He did a show. I went to the show. He got off stage. He was like, yo, tell me what you think. You know, what can I like? He asked for my and I wasn't even that much of like an OG yet, you know, but he knew that like I was kind of sort of more established than he was at that time. And he asked me, he was like, yo, how'd you think of my stage show? You know, what could I do better? Blah, blah, blah. And I just kind of told him, I was like, yo, man, it's kind of tight. But, you know, you got all this stage. I would use it, work the crowd, go move around little stuff. You know, I just kind of told him like little stuff like that. Um. And it's a difference in knowing when somebody's just saying some bullshit because they ain't got nothing better to say and knowing when people are trying to actually help you or just give their opinion. And also you got to, it's a balance that even established artists and more experienced artists got to know, like, yeah, they're giving their opinion about some shit. And you could either take it with a grain of salt, you know, or you can be like, you know, whatever. So yeah. I'll offer a little more background on this because we've been doing a podcast. Two Face Media family's been doing a podcast uh, called Fuck Bro, and it's uh, we we you know sometimes we'll have breakout discussions like this, but m- for the most part, like we get enough music sent into us that what we're doing is we're building a playlist. So we all vote on the songs, and it's a yes or a no. So that's pretty much what every episode has been: is people send us music. Some of it we really fuck with. Some of it we really don't. And either way, we are going to be completely honest about that feedback, you know, and sometimes like with the ones that we really don't like, the feedback is harsh. You know, we definitely do tell them, Um, but we do try to add in there like, hey, this is this is why it makes me feel this way. Mm -hmm. And these are the things that if if you want to improve and and gain my approval at the end of the day or people like me, because you're probably, you know, anybody that makes music has no doubt in their mind that there are however many friends you have that will tell you that was dope because they're afraid to fucking tell you it wasn't right and it's like i might not be your friend i might not ever be your friend but i will never lie to you about my opinion about your music and i think that that is something that like a lot of these people got misconstrued because what we did and this was something that was planned like ahead of time we came up with this idea and it's called March Wackness. So we created a bracket. It was 10, 10 contenders. And we Ten had a of prize. the same songs. It's all the same made songs. Made by so, all uh, different people using the same Chris Calico feature. Yeah, it's an Anno Domini beat pack. It was called uh, Disappear with Chris Calico. And it was we had we listened to 10 of them. And we voted like, this one's definitely worse than, you know, we, we went through, we debated. Um, and then... The other big part that was important to me was when we do this and I drop it, I am going to try to find all of these artists that we reviewed on Facebook and take them in the release of this and let everybody know what this is. Because if we're reviewing their stuff, especially if we're doing it negatively and we're kind of clowning on them, um, I want them to have an opportunity to see it and defend themselves or or at least just get the fucking feedback and the constructive criticism that's offered with it because while we are laughing about most of these while we're going through it we're also ripping each other apart so it becomes very clear that like that's how we operate that's how we Mm -hmm. operate amongst ourselves Mm -hmm. it's an iron sharpens iron mentality that's what hip-hop 
is about in a lot of different respects. That's why you have battle leagues. That's why you have diss tracks. You have stuff like that that doesn't really exist in other genres because it's part of the culture. Right. And it comes from, you know, being critical. Um, and that's honestly, it's one of my favorite things is getting, you know, like Space Case and uh, Denku, you know, some of the guys that are that I look up to in my circle when I get to hear from them, you know, I didn't really like that one. It makes the, yo, I really fuck with this one mean a lot more when it happens because I know it's genuine. I know it's mm -hmm. not this person just trying to give me lip service because they like me, you know, and that's mm -hmm. the thing that I learned yesterday because we post them on Sunday, every, every Sunday at noon. And this last one, um, I had to work all day yesterday. I was running a restaurant by myself. So I couldn't really fucking, I just, it was like setting off a bomb and walking away for a whole day <laughs> my phone was just blowing up but i couldn't look at it i couldn't really do anything about it and uh i got home and it was like it was like world war three you know all these people and i told the, the homies i'm like they're all probably gonna come after me um but i i'm i'm okay with that because at the end of the day it's like all of them that got angry about it only watched what we said about them they didn't watch what this was really about they didn't see all the rest of this stuff. And it just really kind of, I was able to quickly tell them, well, this, this kind of proves my point that everything you're doing is very self-absorbed. You know, you're doing it for yourself. You're not, you don't care about what anybody else thinks. So why do you care about what I think? Because clearly you only care about what you're doing. So why is my opinion matter that much to you? And if I'm hurting you this much, just by saying, Hey, I think this is whack then I think you need to find a way to deal with that so that my opinion don't mean that much to you, whether it's leveling yourself up, hopefully, or it's just not getting past, like you said, building that, building those scabs, building that thicker skin, because it's like, if you really do want to succeed in any art form, the highest of the highs, the Jay-Z's, the Aesop Rocks, the Atmospheres, the, the bigger well-known you get, there's going to be that many more people telling you that you fucking suck, dude. You're horrible. <laughs> Look at sports, bro. Like Kevin mm -hmm. Durant, like this dude is insane, would wash all of these people that are saying it to him. He's getting in wars on Twitter every week with somebody that's like, yo, you trash. Right. You know, and he's, you know, that's just I've, what happens. I've, Humans I, hate. I've, by the way, I've been a Kevin Durant fan since he played for Texas. I right, yo, but you've cold. seen it, though. <laughs> Yeah, he's dope. But, he's but all also, these guys are professional athletes, right? It, it reminds me, Brian Scalabrini said, I am closer to LeBron than you, you are will me. ever be. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. like the 12th man on and the and worst team on everybody. could wash anybody. I, I definitely feel that. I think another thing with the criticism thing, and I haven't had this experience lately, but also, you kind of got to know. You got to know your audience because there there have been people who made like drill stuff and like, yo, tell me what you think of this. And like, I don't know shit about drill music. Why do you want my opinion on this? Like, I'm not the one who you need to be going to with this. Like, I can, now if I can appreciate different types of rap music that I don't even particularly like, like this is a trap song. I don't really fuck with trap, but this one sounds kind of good. He's good at it to me. Now, for somebody who might be into that shit, it might be trash, you know, but I'm not a great, I'm not a good source for that shit, you know, like. Yeah. Well, and on the other end of the spectrum, we have a lot of that on our show, too, through our submissions where, like, we'll have people that send in music because, like, me and Space Case are two of the hosts, and we're both, like, we're boom bap heads. We grew up in metal. We grew up in, like, different genres of that. So we like kind of obscure experimental stuff. And we get a lot of like, uh, you know, like Southern rap sent yeah. into the show. So like a lot of like stuff that sounds like three, six mafia sounds like Nelly sounds like that kind of stuff. Yeah. And th when it's like some of it's really incredible quality. So mm -hmm. it's like when we review it, it's like, yo, this isn't something that I would go out of my way. Like your genre isn't one I go out of my way to find. So I would never have found your music, but I can recognize the talent. I can recognize the the professional quality of the mix that you have going on, like the production behind your videos, the concepts, the the like ability to write a hook and deliver mm -hmm. one. Like some of these people can sing like a mm -hmm. motherfucker. Um, and that's something too, that like, 
hey, even though it's not for me, you know, when we vote, it's like, yo, I'm still going to give that a yes, because that's that song's a good song. You know, it's yeah. not something that I'm going to go out of my way to listen to. But when it's on a playlist, I ain't going to turn it off. Right. I ain't gonna... That's that. I think that's how you do it, too. Like recognizing like, hey, this thing isn't for me, but you did really well at it. Like, right. You are good at this thing that ain't really my thing. And being able to recognize that as someone who is giving critiques is very important. Because, you know, most people will be like, oh, that ain't what I'm used to hearing. That shit is trash. I don't understand it. That shit is trash. That's easy to do, you know. Right. But being able to recognize something that's not necessarily what you're into and being able to see like, okay, this was done really well. Like this this person knows how to write a song. And let's be honest, a lot of our boom bap compadres are not good songwriters at all. (laughs) Bars for days can bar you out. But asking to write a song and it's like i don't want to you know battle rappers oh yes absolutely um so being able to recognize that is very important as someone who is giving critiques of something so i definitely commend you for shit like that man like that that you're doing it the right way well thank you yeah we've gotten i mean this is the thing is like since we started it it's gotten incredibly good feedback um we've had a couple regulars that submit music and like one of them is they, they pretty much everything they send us gets a yes from everybody. It's really, really high quality. And this was the group that kind of sends them like that Southern style. Then there's another guy who the majority of the stuff he sends in, like he's got maybe one or two songs that have gotten voted through, but he's gotten a lot that have gotten just dunked on like <laughs> NBA 2K jam flying from the fucking half court line. Dunked yeah. on. Um, and he keeps sending music in because, you know, I assume it's because it's like, man, this these people are being real with me they're not Mm -hmm. clearly like so when they tell me that hey this was dope i know that they're not just telling me that to say hey that you know to kiss my ass or nothing and the other thing behind it too is like we've seen a lot of like these review show kind of style things are popping up everywhere radio shows online are popping up everywhere um and there's a lot of like it feels like false promotion for people because there's yeah. money being exchanged. So we wanted yeah. to create something different where first and foremost, there is no, hey, you're my buddy. So I'm going to be saying nice stuff about everything that you send me. There's none of that going on. But then two, there's no money coming back and forth. There's never going to be a conflict of interest. We don't want no money for this. We just want to provide a, a service for hip hop because right. I think like it might be a small thing, but I think every you know anybody that can offer any energy that helps – preserve and cultivate the culture of hip-hop as we we want it to be that's where it starts to get yeah. everybody going how do we get boom bap to the forefront how do we get you know whatever we want how do we get the lyrical shit to a, the forefront we start doing things that really we're able to share the appreciation for why we are the way we are um and also prove to other people too that it's not just like hey uh, the only people that make good music are us because we make the kind of music we like to hear. And it's like, yeah. for me as a listener, I didn't find hip hop until like five years ago. Mm-hmm. So it's like, I was listening to completely different music. So I listened to the wildest shit. Um, you know, sometimes I'll listen to hip hop and only hip hop for a month. Sometimes I'll listen to fucking like Alanis Morissette and fucking Modest Mouse for like a month. You know, it's like a completely different vibe and style of music. And it's like, and I think it just kind of tra- like good music is good music. It does not matter what the genre is. It's mm-hmm. like I, I look at it as somebody that's always worked in like the bar and restaurant industry where you've got music going on all the time. And when I'm there late at night, don't matter what the genre is, a good tune has everybody engaged, you yep. know, and we play hip hop, we play country, we play rock, we play everything in between and all of it, you know, if it's good, people are having a good time. And if somebody puts on something that's trash, I get told, you got to change this, man. You got to skip this one because I got the remote. <laughs> you know, yep. I can skip the, the jukebox. So it's like you learn really fast that like the overall, it's like the background. You walk in through the store, you know, like, are you happier yeah. in a store that's playing music that's good, whether regardless of the genre? Absolutely you are. You know, mm-hmm. it's <laughs> real, quick, pest, real quick, Pesto, you had mentioned, um, NBA Jam from the free throw line. I'm just curious. Uh, what's what squad do y'all roll with in NBA Jam? 
Yeah, I come from the era that I would always, and, and this is going to sound like a bitch move because it kind of is, but I like, I'm glad that time has preserved them both as true greats and fucking awesome. Uh, I would always roll with Kobe and Shaq Lakers when I played because uh-huh. that was like the fucking generation of NBA Jam that I played the most. I would always, because it's like, man, Kobe is so cold and then no one can stop Shaq. Like, no one's blocking Shaq. Shaq is dunking on everybody. When he goes up there, you ain't blocking Shaq. Yeah. So so I think Danku knows I'm a basketball junkie, man. And I would, I would, I would play with a bunch of teams. I would play, I would get busy with the Portland Trailblazers with Clyde Drexler and Terry mm-hmm. Porter. Drexler, yep. Drexler okay. and That's Porter. Um uh the the Mavericks with um Mashburn a kid. Um, who else was it that I used to get busy with? Just because, you know, uh LJ and Alonzo Morning, that that short mm. time they were together on the Hornets. Hornets, Hornets yeah. fire. Yeah. Like, yeah, man. I, I ran with a lot of a lot of different squads, man, on, on NBA Jam. I I usually did too. I mean, I I, I mean I played it arcade shit. Like I used to yeah. make arcade playing the joint, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So mad quarters. So when when I used to play that. Um, my two squads I would normally pick would be Seattle Supersonics, mm. Kemp and Peyton, and uh, the Warriors, Chris Mullen, Tim. Oh Hardaway. yeah, Tim Hardaway. Yeah, yeah. Because they could both shoot threes, mm-hmm. and even though they weren't, they didn't have no big man like Seattle had Kemp. Big yeah. man, also nice with the dunks. And then um, Gary Payne was just taking the ball all day. Yeah, and yeah. that's what and that's what Hardaway <laughs> would do. He would yeah. just steal the ball from everybody. You just and taking Chris, the ball. And then him and Chris Mullen could drain the three point joints. Yep. You know what I'm yep. Yep. Like you didn't have the dunks with him, really, but they're hitting three. So so people you, are running down the court <laughs> doing the crazy dunks, and I just come back on the other side and hit the threes, and then like, ah, fuck. Right, right. Dude, yeah, no one get no nothing gets your like you're playing with your friend, dunking on him. Like you would think that that would be hurting the ego more, but when you start nailing those threes and they can't stop it, yeah, it makes them far angrier. Yeah, yeah, you get that rage quit. Yeah, you get that like they start making bad plays. Yeah, that, <laughs> you know, that used to be my favorite shit. Um, back because my favorite basketball games to ever play. I mean, two K is amazing. Like it looks realistic. It's like you're playing. It's like you're at the fucking game. Like, the shit looks realistic as fuck. But my favorite shit still to this day is the fucking college basketball games. Mm, I used to love those motherfucking games. Even though you have to download the actual roster names to have the real motherfucking names in the game. Yeah. I mean, those Well, that shouldn't be the case anymore, right? Well, well, it'll never happen. They're never well, they're bringing back out. NCAA 25 now. They're bringing back the football. Football, one. football. But that's, that's be, and yeah, I don't think we'll see basketball. We might see it, but they're bringing back football because now college players are getting fucking millions of dollar Money. endorsements, which is crazy. So you think they're going to have to have their names in there, right? Yeah, they, yeah, they will. But will all of them? Will all of them? No, nah, I don't think all of them will. Not all of them. Not all of them, no. But like all the like big teams, you know, your Ohio States, your Alabamas, your Floridas, yeah. Yeah, but, you know, your but, stuff but, like that. But will they it will. be every player though? I don't think so. I think it's I think it'll be your be the like all-star your star players. Mm-hmm. And then oh, the other you think players very select. And then the other players you're gonna have to basically like they used to do, download. Yeah. The fucking roster names that that people spend. I I can't. I don't even understand how people do it. Like, how do you spend a whole week or an afternoon going through every college Switching roster the sliders, and the, fucking the typing the numbers. all the names out and doing that shit? Who the fuck is doing? I mean, thank you. Thank you for <laughs> right. doing that. You had the wrong energy for what right. thank you for doing yes. that. But who <laughs> the fuck does that shit that's crazy yeah. to me yeah like it's insane. yeah that i agree it's yeah the data processing is crazy mm-hmm. but this is the thing is, is i've actually like so i think i kind of have an idea of the kind of person that does it because i worked in uh i worked in a provisioning department for a cell phone carrier 
for a couple of years. So it was like I was the one that was programming the SIM cards, the international roaming stuff. Like I just kind of background tech work. And there was like five people in my department, including me. And one of them was a dude that was simulating. He had created an entire league of baseball teams. And then he was simulating through dice rolls, like the outcomes of these games. And he had a spreadsheet and he was in like year 28 of this league. Like he had all of this, like fucking, he had all these statistics and all this shit. And he's just on an Excel spreadsheet. That's like thousands of pages long, every game logged. He's got every season, all the games, every team, every, everything. And he's designing logos. I just, but it's like, (laughs) <laughs> but it's like while he's at work and he's doing because like we were like a call center, too. And it was like, honestly, like we each had our own duty. It would take us maybe an hour and a half to do our, our daily duties. But we're there for eight to nine. So it's like if you're there for nine hours, you're done with your stuff in an hour and a half. I wrote music when I was done. When he was done, he did that. It yeah. just pacified him. You know, you get those people that just sitting there and, and, and pecking away at something. It's just the same people that are on level 10 billion of Candy Crush. It's like you're playing right. the same game. Or Tetris, like the people that have the unbelievable, unbreakable Tetris world records. It's like you play Tetris like enough times, like it does have a little replayability over the years, but the majority of people ain't going to just keep playing Tetris or right. master in the Rubik's Cube. You're like, dang. like Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, that's... Malls, this has been dope, man. I don't want to keep you too much longer. I know it's damn near almost eleven o'clock by you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, I will say, this having you on the podcast is very long overdue. Um, the same exact thing with getting you on a track or vice versa. <laughs> it has not happened yet, and I don't yeah. know why it hasn't <laughs> happened. Hey, man, the, the inbox is open, bro. The yeah, inbox is open. We, we will have to make it happen. Even if it's, I mean, maybe it'll be a Denku Pestilence Malls joint. Maybe that'll be a thing. I, you know, I'm I don't with know. It. I'm with it. Um, Let's do it. But yes, uh, if you want, give your shout outs real quick where people can check your music and all that. Word. Hey, look, man. Um, malls.bandcamp.com if you're nasty. You know what I'm saying? That's where you could get all the music. Um Obviously, it's on the Spotify's and the the Apple Music's and all that stuff. But you know, we we real here. We support the artist. Um, I'm still I'm still on Twitter, man. It's it's not the same, but I'm still there at Malls M A L L Z. Um, on Instagram at Malzini M A L L Z I N I. Um, I'm actually on Blue Sky, so I'm at Malls on Blue Sky. I'm starting to get into that a little bit. Um, not too many people are on that, so it's. I don't even know what that is. Yeah, it, I, don't even, I was gonna say the same thing. I don't know what the fuck the, that is. The Jack, the dude who made Twitter, once he sold it to that guy, um, he went and was like, "Okay, I'm gonna make another one." So, okay, he made another hove, you know. <laughs> so that, that's that's basically what that is. That is that is that is the that is the Gilberg of Twitter, like. Blue sky. That's it. Yeah. Um, okay. But, you know, if you must do Facebook, it's at Malzini as well. But honestly, just follow me on Instagram because it's the exact same thing. Like the only thing that goes on my Facebook is what I put on Instagram. Uh, so that's where you can find me. That's where you can find the music. Um, yeah, man, this has been real dope, man. Real dope. Yeah, man. I appreciate you being on, man. Um, yeah, nice to meet you, brother. Yes, yeah, sir. Man. Likewise. This, this, this has been Cypher Den Chat. I'm your host, Tayamu Danku. That's the homie Pestilence. Shouts to the rest of the crew. And we had special mess. Special mess. Special guest. Jesus Christ. I, I am a special <laughs> mess. I, I must not have <laughs> enough water at, during this episode. I don't know what's going on. But yo, this is special guest Malls in the building by way of North Carolina. And uh, it's been super dope, man. Lots of dope opinions, lots of dope talk, lots of dope hip hop, lots of dope everything. And we will be getting a song in very soon, man. But everybody that has tuned in and listened, we appreciate you. The replay will be posted on Friday, so stay tuned for that. If you didn't catch the live, everybody, and we are out of here until next time. Peace. Peace, peace. Peace.